Good morning. We welcome you to worship with us this morning at Grace Covenant, whether you are here in person or worshiping with us at home online. We are grateful that you are here with us in this fifth Sunday in the season of Thanksgiving when we are giving thanks to God for who we are as the people of God. With that in mind, let us worship. If that doesn't give you joy in your heart, let's cast you a Scrooge. I'm going to invite you to stand and join me as that spirit of praise continues and giving thanks to God in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God among the communion of saints. Let them praise the Lord with dance and celebrate with musical instruments. Let all the saints jump for joy. Let them cry out with gladness where they rest. Let the high praises of God be in their throats, word and song that will overcome injustice, binding rulers in chains and the powerful in the iron shackles, bringing justice Praise the Lord.
Kids, where are you at? I need you up front. Come on, Brody, buddy. I miss Ken. They, I got on the floor. I got on the floor with them, Sue. That's how they knew to be on the floor. <laughs> there they are. Hi. Uh, looking for yourself, is that it? Checking carefully. All right, guys, good to see you. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah. Now, we did our trunk or treat here at the church last Sunday. Did you go trick or treating on Monday? I should have been able to tell. And how many, how many of you did your dads eat a bunch of your candy? All of it. All of it. All of it. Well, Chris, <laughs> Brody claims you ate all of it. Well. All right. Well, you know, we haven't seen somebody in a while. We haven't seen Stuart, so let's check and see if he's home. Stuart, are you there? <laughs> oh, good morning, Pastor Mitch, and hello, everyone. It's good to see you, Stuart. We missed you this week. Is that so? Well, why is that? Well, last Sunday was Reformation Sunday. Ah, the day we celebrate all things Presbyterian. A lovely day for sure. What's your favorite thing about being a Presbyterian, Stuart? Hmm, bagpipes, kilts, and shortbread. <laughs> Bagpipes, kilts, and shortbread. That sounds like your favorite Scottish things. Well, of course. What about the church? Well, I told you, I'm a Scottish Presbyterian after all, but I also love the way we work together to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. That's a great thing about Presbyterians. Do you know why we want to treat everyone so well? Well, because it's the right thing to do. Well, of course, it's the right thing to do, but it's also because Jesus had said we should do that. We are Christians, so we follow the teachings of Jesus, right? Oh, I know one thing Jesus said that is about treating people fairly. What's that? Do to others what you want them to do to you. Very good, Stuart. Do you know what we call that? Uh, teaching of Jesus. Yes, and the golden rule. Ah. Kids, do you know the golden rule? Do you guys know the golden rule at all? Some of you do. Some do. Some do. Okay. I don't know that all. Okay. Well, then you know what to do, Stuart. All right. All right. Then listen, all of us, listen. let's. Yeah. <laughs> then let's say it together. I, I, sorry. So I'm going to say a part of it, and I want listen you to all. Listen to Stuart. Right, we and hello. <laughs> I'll say part of the golden rule, and I want you to repeat after me. All right? Okay. Do to others. Do to others. What you want them. What you want them to do to you. To do to you. Okay, guys, let's say this all together. Do to others what you want them to do to you. Okay, so I guess I better bring you all some treats soon. Why is that, Stuart? Because I want some shortbread. <laughs> I don't think that's quite what Jesus meant. No? Not exactly. Jesus wants us to take care of each other, to be kind to each other, just like we want to be treated. So listen, kids. Tell you what, this week, could you do something? What could you do this week to be kind to somebody else? Yes, sir. Make somebody happy. You've been pulling out the good answers here for a while there, young man. Give your brother your toys. Yes, Evie. Share your stuffing. 
Uh, 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 yum. I'm glad to see somebody share their stuffing. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, surely you can come up with some ideas like, uh, could you be nice to one of your friends at school? Could you? Abel says yes. Oh, Abel says yes. I can tell. <laughs> They've been heavily sugared up this morning. They've been eating Christmas. Yeah. All right, guys. Those are, those are just some ideas of things we can do. What about you, Stuart? Well, I look forward to hearing how those ideas work for you all. I bet you'll find that when you're kind to someone, they will be kind back. I bet they will. Well, I'll tell you what, let's pray together, okay, Stuart? Here, I'll do it, Pastor All Mitch. Right. That's nice of you, Stuart. All right, let's pray. Dear God, help us to live by the golden rule. Help us remember to always be kind to others. Help us to do good for others. And help us to share your love every day. Amen. That was really a nice prayer, Stuart. Thank you for sharing with us. You're welcome. Well, kids, I think you can go now either to Awakening to Worship or stay with your folks, whatever you'd like to do. Hey, Pastor Mitch, do you think God will send me some shortbread since that was such a good prayer? <laughs> we'll, go, we'll talk about that later, Stuart, okay? All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Goodbye. When we come before God in worship, it is important that we take time to pause and clear those things in our hearts and minds that have distracted us from being faithful to God, anything that separates us from God and from one another. And so I invite you to join me in this prayer of confession. Please pray with me. God, you loved this world so much that you sent your own Son, Jesus Christ, to live and die among us in order that we might have life. Forgive us for keeping that abundant life to ourselves, for jealously hoarding your generous gifts, for choosing self-interest over compassion and justice. Teach us what it means to live as children of the light, generously sharing your abundance with our siblings in need. Amen. Now I invite you to take a moment and to offer to God those personal things that you would like to share silently. Friends, we have been blessed with good news, that we are forgiven those things that have caused harm to others and to God, because God is merciful and desires to offer us a fresh start. So know that you are forgiven and be at peace. And now I invite you to share that peace with one another with a symbol of the peace, whether over the heart or a peace sign. Share the peace of Christ with one another, saying, may the peace of Christ be with you.
Good morning. The Old Testament lesson today is from the book of Exodus, chapter three, verses seven through 14, and chapter four, verses 10 through 13. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of the land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you. And this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you'll come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to the Lord, my Lord, I I've never been able to speak well, not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you've been talking to your servant. I have a slow mouth and a thick tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gives people the ability to speak? Who's responsible for making them unable to speak or hard of hearing, sighted or blind? <laughs> Isn't it I, the Lord? Now go, I'll help you speak and I'll teach you what you should say. But Moses said, please, Lord, just send someone else.
The gospel lesson is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. I have a letter to share with you this morning that comes from the General Council of the Presbyterian Church. It begins, Dear fellow Presbyterians, the General Assembly has made the following pronouncement for the guidance of all Presbyterians. All human life should be lived in accordance with the principles established by God for the life of humankind and of nations. This is a tenet of biblical religion. It is also a basic emphasis in our Presbyterian heritage of faith. As individuals and as a group, Christians are responsible for adjusting their thought and behavior to those everlasting principles which God has revealed in Holy Scripture. It is no less their responsibility as citizens of their nation to seek as far as their influence will extend to bring national life and all institutions of society into conformity with the moral government of God and into harmony with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Things are happening in our national life and in the international sphere which should give us deep concern. Serious thought needs to be given to the world today and to the undoubted aim on the part of leaders to subvert the thought and life of the United States the structure of American society is in peril of being shattered by a satanic conspiracy. Dangerous developments are taking place in our national life. Favored by an atmosphere of intense disquiet and suspicion, a subtle but potent assault upon basic human rights is now in progress. Treason and dissent are being confused. The shrine of conscience and private judgment, which God alone has the right to enter, is being invaded. Un-American attitudes towards ideas and books are becoming current. Attacks are being made upon citizens of integrity and social passion, which are utterly alien to our democratic tradition. They are particularly alien to the Protestant religious tradition, which has been a main source of the freedoms which the people of the United States enjoy. We suggest, therefore, that all Presbyterians give earnest consideration to the following three basic principles and their implications for our thought and life. One, the Christian church has a prophetic function to fulfill in every society and in every age. Whatever concerns humankind and their welfare is a concern of the church and its ministers. Religion has to do with the wholeness of life. It is therefore under obligation to consider the life of humanity in the light of God's purpose for Christ in the world. While it is not the role of the Christian church to present blueprints for the organization of society and the conduct of government, the church owes it to its own members and to all humankind in general to draw attention to violations of those spiritual bases of human relationship which have been established by God. It has the obligation to proclaim those principles, to instill that spirit, which are essential for social health and form the indispensable foundation of sound and stable policies in the affairs of state. Number two, the majesty of truth must be preserved at all times and at all costs. Loyalty to truth is the common basis of true religion and true culture. Despite the lofty idealism of many of our national leaders, truth is being subtly and silently dethroned by prominent public figures. Falsehood is frequently preferred to fact if it can be shown to have a greater propaganda value. In the interests of propaganda, truth is deliberately distorted and remains unspoken. Truth is thus a captive in the land of the free. 
Three, God's sovereign rule is the controlling factor in history. We speak of this nation under God. Nothing is needed more today than to explore afresh and to apply to all the problems of thought and life in our generation what it means to take God seriously in our national life. There is an order of God. Even in these days of flux, God reigns. Does anyone want to take a stab at when that letter was written? 1952. Were you doing a Google check? (laughs) You're very close. It was written in 1953. But doesn't it sound like something that could have been written today? It sure does. Many of us here today, think about that, we're not even born yet. Or at least we're very young when that letter was written. Does anybody remember what the issue was at the time that the church was speaking to? McCarthyism, McCarthyism, fear of communism. Yeah. Now, I took the liberty of updating the language in that so it would throw you off just a little bit (laughs) because it used language like man and mankind. And I changed it to read human humanity and humankind if you would like to read the full letter an unedited copy of it we have some copies that we can make available to you you can check with mitch or with me um, or if you want to just send us an email we will email to you especially if you are at home and would like to read that letter i shared the letter with you this morning because i want to address one of the issues that plagues the church these days, especially Protestant churches and Presbyterians, and that is the issue of politics and the church. It's an issue that's become a source of tension in American Christianity in more recent years. There is confusion about the role of the church in in political issues that has caused some very deep conflict in congregations. It has pushed some people to leave churches. There's even been some of that here at GCPC. And I believe that the best way to help resolve confusion and conflict is to shine the light on it. So at this time of year, when we are giving thanks for our Reformed and Presbyterian heritage, and with an election that's pretty contentious just a few days away, I invite you to take a little time to think with me about some Presbyterian heritage and theology. In the letter I just shared with you, the first point said, the Christian church has a prophetic function to fulfill in every society and in every age. Whatever concerns humankind and their welfare is a concern of the church and its ministers. This is a very basic, fundamental principle that was emphasized by our founder, John Calvin. Calvin upheld this very biblical understanding that all of life is lived in the presence of God. You can't separate government from your life. You can't separate the church from government. It's our responsibility as citizens of this world and of this nation to work together for the welfare of all humankind. You'll find that principle in the first two chapters of Genesis. God established that humankind was responsible for the care of the world and the welfare of all people and animals. Among other things, this means that both rulers and their subjects are accountable to God. All you have to do is take a little tour through the Old Testament to see how the stories of the Old Testament are about the relationship of the people of faith in their kingdoms, the relationship of monarchs and and leaders to God, and their responsibilities to the people. The religious reform that was born during the Reformation that we have just been celebrating was meant to lead social, political, and economic reform. And all of this is pursued for the glory of God. One of the things that I really appreciated about being a Midwesterner who moved to the Northeast to serve some churches for a while was the opportunity to learn about the history of the United States in a very tangible, present way. The church we served in New Jersey was chartered in 1758. Think about that. It was on a pathway that was frequently frequently traveled from New York City to Philadelphia. You could think of it as kind of being on the political trade route of the day. 
And there were members of the congregation who were political and military leaders. There's a great story about the church that George Washington attended worship there, and one time after a service, he stood on the church lawn and he recruited soldiers and then headed up the hill to the iron mine to order the cannonballs that were the best for the military. It was a congregation of people who participated, literally participated, in the plotting and planning of the revolution against the tyranny of Great Britain. Throughout the colonies, though, not just at that church, pastors were actively involved in preaching and teaching a vision of justice and independence from an oppressive government. In many ways, the revolution was a holy war. You will find historians who will confirm that. Ambrose Searle was secretary to the British General Howe in New York City, and he wrote to the British Secretary of State in 1776 telling him about the American Revolution and how it was ultimately a religious war. Searle boldly asserted that the revolution could not have been sustained in America if it weren't for the Presbyterian ministers who bred it. He lamented the fact that almost every minister in America doubled as a politician. And most significantly, he echoed a chant by loyalists throughout America, namely that at the bottom of the conflict was those Presbyterians and their desire to gain the establishment of their own party. In other words, he claimed that the war was fueled by the Presbyterians' desire to establish their religion as the official church of the new American government. Well, King George, after hearing these reports, named the revolution the Presbyterian Rebellion. <laughs> Hi, Presbyterians. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in what the secretary reported, but one thing he did get wrong, and it's important for our understanding today. The Presbyterians did not want to establish Presbyterianism as the official church of a new nation. In fact, many of them were in the colonies because they wanted to be free of a state church. What the Presbyterians wanted was a democracy where people could freely practice their faith, no matter what religion they practice, without having to fear the government's intrusion in their faith. No state-mandated religion is what separation of church and state means. The influence of Presbyterians in the drafting of the Constitution is undeniable. How many of you heard of James Madison? <laughs> The man who wrote the Constitution was a Presbyterian. He had a pew in his church with his name on it, literally. He attended the College of New Jersey, which today is known as Princeton University, which is the home of our oldest Presbyterian seminary, and today has those deep Presbyterian roots. He was lucky to be able to study under the Reverend John Witherspoon, who came from Scotland and was instrumental in that uprising of the revolution. Did you know, though, that Madison studied theology and considered becoming a Presbyterian minister? You may not have known that. Instead, he became a political theorist and was one of the most influ influential of the founding fathers. I'm just going to put this out there. It's not trying to wear a badge of honor, but if you have ever noticed parallels between our Presbyterian polity and our national government, there's a good reason for it. You've surely heard of the three branches of government, teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons. <laughs> Concepts like the balance of power and checks and balances are principles shared by Presbyterians of the day who had an understanding of democracy that obviously appealed to the rest of the founders. And that is just one of the Presbyterian stories of political engagement. So it wouldn't be wrong to say that political involvement is in the DNA of Presbyterians all the way back to John Knox in Scotland. <coughs> but for us as American Presbyterians, we often struggle with politics and church because we understand that separation of church and state is constitutional. But remember, Madison wrote that. Mm think about that for a while. But it's become understood as a reason why churches shouldn't address anything that the government is involved in. But you need to know that that is a very recent development in history. 
The Reverend Jimmy Hawkins, who's the director of our Office of Public Witness in Washington, D.C., addressed this in an article that was named, Why Are Presbyterians Sticking Their Noses in Politics? He said, we are speaking out of following the mandate that we have received from Jesus and from Scripture. You cannot read Scripture and not talk about justice. It's throughout the pages. As a matter of fact, Hawkins said, the second book of the Bible that we heard from this morning, the book of Exodus, is about deliverance from slavery and how God intervened to set that which is wrong right. He adds, I think people have a real misconception of what it means to be a person of faith, especially in this American context that we are in. People talk about separation of church and state and think that it means that that, is no, that means there is no engagement, and that is not what it means. Actually, what it means is that it's a protection of our rights as people of faith so that the government cannot dictate to us what to believe and how to do it. Which, if you watched any of the Queen's funerals, you know that the one in Scotland was very different from the one in England. In Scotland, when they did the welcome, they made it very clear that this is a church where Jesus Christ is the head of the church, as opposed to the Church of England, where the Queen was the head of the church. There's nothing in our Constitution that says we cannot be involved in politics. Hawkins then cites the Johnson Amendment, the 1954 legislation that was introduced by Lyndon B. Johnson, which said that nonprofit organizations, including churches, cannot endorse or oppose political candidates. But that, as Hawkins notes, is where it ends. In other words, no endorsements, no financial contributions to and from politicians. The Reverend Christian Brooks, who is a representative for domestic poverty issues and the co-founder of the Presbyterian Voting Campaign, you may not have known there was such a group, she it was also featured in that article and she explained further, as we look throughout the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, we see Jesus talking about how you have some people being greedy and taking advantage of women, taking advantage of the poor, and how that wasn't right. As we're still talking about those issues, we have to talk about the effects of that, the effects of taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of marginalized com communities, which includes things like food insecurity and homelessness. Also, as we are in communities with folks, we have to speak to the issues they live with. We need to know and understand the scriptural basis for why we do these things. I can't say to my neighbor, I love you, you're hungry, but I'm not going to say anything about the fact that you're hungry. I'm not going to address the root causes of why you're hungry. I'm not speaking out against the policies that are putting you in the position of being hungry. Brooks explains one part of the reason, though, that people sometimes don't understand why Presbyterian leaders speak out on political issues is that mainstream evangelical Christianity in the United States emphasizes a message of personal salvation that should be the sole focus of their ministry. If you claim yourself as a Christian, however, it's not just preaching that everybody needs to be saved. That's a quote from Reverend Lee Cato, who's the managing editor, editor of Unbound and the associate for young adult social witness in the Peace USA. Yesterday, Mitch and I attended an anti-racism training, which is required by our presbytery, and I believe it's going to be twice a year for all ministers and leaders in the presbytery are encouraged to attend. Yesterday, the training focused on the history and the impact of the Native Americans of the colonization of America. It was hard to hear, especially since my ancestors, some of them at least, came on the Mayflower. As we were reflecting on this presentation with our colleagues, Mitch said something that I think was very important. He said, one of the problems that we have today in the church is that people label anything that has to do with justice as political. Social justice, social justice in the PCUSA is founded on this principle. 
all of life is lived in the presence of God. And we are responsible as citizens of our nation to seek as far as our influence will extend to bring national life and all institutions of society into conformity with the moral government of God. Of course, the difficulty is always how to interpret what God's moral government looks like. And the letter that I read makes it clear that it is not our mission to provide a blueprint for the government. It is not our mission to impose our beliefs on the nation. It is our mission to work for justice, to uphold the human rights of all people. It is our mission to use our influence as far as it will extend to ensure that there is liberty and justice for all. So if you happen to hear through the grapevine that your pastors want to make the church more political, that's really not the case. In fact, that would be an extremely heavy lift. If you, ask, if you hear a rumor that your pastors are preaching liberal politics and conservative views are not welcome, that is not the case. In fact, quite the opposite. We believe, I'm speaking for Mitch and myself, that it takes a variety of voices working together to be able to best discern the issues of justice. If you feel that issues are being addressed in the pulpit more than they were in the past, it might be because of the moment in history in which we are living, and we cannot turn a blind eye and ignore what's happening in our nation. Or, as someone else suggested in the church, it might be a lapse in memory of what was preached in the past. But this you can count on. We will never preach partisan politics but we will explore issues. That is our responsibility as preachers of God's word. We will look at what the PCUSA is saying about justice issues so that you're aware of what our siblings in Christ is saying. And these are decisions, never assume that the, the positions of the PCUSA are made by a group of liberal leaders who work in Louisville. The positions of the PCUSA are made by ministers and elders who come together every two years by the hundreds and work together to discern and listen to God's word and the contemporary culture and seek to make decisions that we feel is where God is leading us. It is done by the people in the congregations, not by a lofty group on high. It will be up to you to decide what leaders best represent your beliefs. We will not tell you what party you should, so, should support or how you should vote. We will not advocate for a candidate. We would put your nonprofit status at risk if we did. But when an issue is addressed in the pulpit, there will be biblically grounded teaching that comes from the reformed tradition in which we are a part, in which Mitch and I have vowed as ministers of word and sacrament to uphold. It will be presented with the goal of seeking to be faithful to Jesus Christ, who is the head of our church, not the king. If you ever question something that we say, or if you feel uncomfortable with something that we say, which is likely to happen, you cannot read the Bible without being uncomfortable from time to time. I encourage you to feel free to visit with us. Quite frankly, that's one way that we can work for justice for all of us. And to do otherwise or to choose to stand in opposition can cause harm in the community. This is something that we probably should have said about four years ago. But we didn't want to, you know, stir things up. But I hope that it helps you understand a bit more about what it means to be Presbyterian and a part of a PCUSA congregation and who Mitch and I are as your pastors. It is my prayer that God will bless us with guidance and wisdom, with ears to hear one another's different viewpoints so that we can work together in faithfulness to God. May it be so. Amen.
Good morning. Thank you, Sue. Um, just a couple of quick notes about the pledge drive. Lots of pledges in already. And the first thing I wanted to say, even before that, is thank you. Um, you guys support Grace Covenant and our mission so amazingly well. The pledges we've received already have increased over last year. Um, so please, if you haven't, get your pledge in. Um, if you want to keep it the same, you can either just not do anything and it will roll over, or you can also send in a pledge and just say keep it the same as last year. If you notice in your bulletin, there is a QR code for the pledge portal, so you can scan that with your phone. You just take out the, open up the camera, scan it, and it will get you a link to the pledge portal. You can also find it on our website. We also have sheets of paper out front where if you want to fill it out uh, in a piece of paper, you can do that. Or you can also send an email to finance at gcpc.org. So thank you very much, and please, if you want to, get your pledge in, or if not, in December it will roll over. Thank you. We are going to uh, pray for a moment and then we are going to remember the saints connected to our congregation whom we have lost in this last year. As we read the names that you will find in our bulletin, if you are a family member, we invite you to come forward and light a candle and memory of the loved one you have lost. Let us pray. Most holy God, today we remember and give thanks for those who have been faithful leaders who have sought throughout time and space to understand who you call us to be and who have contributed to making us who we are today. We pray, O oh God, for the world that we live in that is divided and fractured at every turn. Where there is war, may there be a pathway to peace. And so we give thanks for the work of the United Nations, which was fueled with support from the Presbyterian Church, for the work that they do, a safe place for leaders from every nation to come together and negotiate pathways to peace. We pray for their work. We pray for our nation as we face an election this week that has the potential to be contentious. Where there are those who would seek violence and aggression, we pray that you will help us to work for peace. We pray that you will guide each one of us as we make decisions about which leaders are the best for us. And may each one of us be a faithful citizen in this nation under God. We pray, O oh God, for your sovereign leadership, recognizing that all of life belongs to you and that you have asked us to be stewards of your creation. And so we give thanks for those who are working for the care of our environment. We pray that you will help us to learn more and become even better caretakers. We pray, O oh God, for those in our world who are continuing to struggle with the illnesses that are at huge, almost pandemic levels for doctors and nurses and scientists and medical workers who are once again facing overwhelming cases of illness in hospitals that the beds are all too full. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for those in our congregation who are dealing with illnesses and health concerns, for those who are facing surgeries and those recovering from surgeries, those who are dealing with, with the side effects of treatments, and those who have no further treatment options and are facing the end of days. May all know the comfort and peace that you offer through your spirit and through your people. And holy God, we remember the saints who have passed in this year. As our hearts continue to grieve, we remember them. 
Colleen Carroll. Harold DeBoer. Ralph J. Hoffman II, better known as Joe Hoffman. Kathy Jonas. Michelle Rader. Paul Thomas. Bob Warmus. Dwayne Welsh. Gary Du Bois. Norma Marie Barnett. Audrey Miller. Skylar Foster. Diane Bockelman. Alice Gilbert. James Patrick Schmidt, Jr. Hammond DeJean, Jr. Cora Citizen. Beatrice Thomas. Carolyn Moss. Broderick Kelly. Willis Glenn Walton, Sr. Lionel Douglas. <coughs> Harold Lennis Tompkins. Zach Corman. as we remember those we have named and light a flame to represent the love that we carry in our hearts. O oh, holy God, we give thanks for all these saints. Amen. When Jesus gathered at the table with his disciples, he was already stirring up trouble. It was dangerous for him to even be in Jerusalem because some of the things that he had said and done had struck political nerves and he knew his life was at risk. And still he carried on his work and gathered his disciples together knowing it was his last meal with them May we gather at this table remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us that was not only a gift of salvation for eternal life, but an example to us of the risk of doing God's work in the world. Friends, this is the Lord's table. All are welcome at this table who come and are seeking to be faithful to God. And so let us come to the table praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our oh, Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was at supper with his friends. And he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And then he gave it to them, saying, take this and eat. But do it in remembrance of me. Look upon this as my body broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the renewed covenant, 
sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And that is why every time, every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Take your elements at home and in the worship service here in person and know that you are God's beloved. Please pray with me. Most holy God, at this table we encounter your spirit. May your love for us and your desire for justice in the world breathe into our bodies so that like you we embody what it is to be faithful. And we may we take your love and your passion and your desire for justice out into the world so that all may know the well-being of your kingdom of God. We pray this with gratitude in our hearts. Amen.
few announcements before we go. One is that our Advent Fair, yes, you may be seated. You don't have to stand through all of them. Our Advent Fair is November 20th. It's during the Sunday school hour. It is for all ages. If you watched the video last week, some of my favorite pictures were the pictures of the adults gathered around the tables doing the activities and taking home Advent wreaths. Come and join us. But I could use some help. We're going to need to set up on the 19th, and I have to bump that setup time to 3 o'clock in the afternoon because it is a Presbytery day, and I will be at Presbytery in the morning and can't set up. So if you can come and help sign up, go to the Sign Up Genius that has been going out in the midweek announcements, and it's also on our website. And yeah, there is still one more table that could use a helping hand. It's not essential, but if you would be willing to help children and adults put together Advent chains, I would love to have you volunteer. just means being at the table and helping instruct them. Also speaking of Advent, it's red bag time. Angela Crute has an announcement. <clears throat> Good morning. The red bag stockings are here, as you may have seen. We are again helping the red bag organization provide Christmas gifts to foster children and families in need. This year, we're providing gifts for 30 children. Each child will receive 10 gifts from us. In the hallway toward Heartland Hall, currently today sharing space with the voting machines, um, you'll find the posters. On each poster is the name of a child we are providing gifts for this Christmas. Also on each poster is a list of the gifts we would like to provide for that child, along with a post-it note containing the gift. If you would like to help, select the gift or gifts you would like to provide, write your name, phone number, and email address to the right and take the post-it note. Hang on to that post-it note because it's now become a piece of crucial information. In the past, some folks have taken pictures of their post-it notes in case they happen to get lost. Once you have purchased the gift, you should wrap it, stick the post-it note on it, and return it to the big boxes underneath the tables in the hallway. The youth will be again providing a wrapping service this year. More details to come on that. If you sign up to fill a stocking this year, please take a handmade by our own crafters stocking from the box under the table. There is a stocking for every child we are providing gifts for. Gifts must be returned no later than November 27th. The sooner the better. If you have questions, please call, text, or email me. My information is in the bulletin. Thank you, Angela. Sunday school this morning. The adult classes have a couple of new offerings. One of them is going to be a really fun class with Tom Stroud, where he's going to talk about Cain and Abel. So you can join him in room four. And the, Kathy Williams invaded the closet this morning where we have all of our stoles and pyramids and took them to her class, where they are going to be talking about the seasons of the church year and why we do what we do and what those symbols mean. So you can join them in room three. If you are watching at home, you can, you can zoom in. The links should be available. Um, knowing Kim, she's probably making them available, but also they would be in our midweek announcements and in the bulletin. So we hope that you will join us and uh, have some great conversation this morning. One last thing before we do the benediction. This coming week, we will honor the veterans of our nation. And to me, that is important. My brother is a veteran. And I know that many of you are. So I want to take a moment to ask our veterans in the congregation to please stand so that we can recognize you and give thanks for your service. Yay. <laughs> we will remember you on Veterans Day this week. So the sermon that I preached this morning is one that I would have preferred not to preach. It's one of those issues that clergy try and steer away from. But in recent years, some of our Presbyterian clergy have been dismissed from churches for speaking of political issues, so much so that the denomination felt the need to issue that article, why are Presbyterians sticking their noses in politics? I am a firm believer that if you are going to call yourself Presbyterian and be part of a Presbyterian church, you ought to understand what that means. And so I share that with you this morning. I was trying to think of a simile, but 
asking a Presbyterian minister not to speak on justice issues is, I don't know, like asking a dog not to wag its tail, a frog not to jump. Um, it is who we have been trained to be. It is deeply ingrained in our understanding of what God calls us to do and be in Scripture. There's one thing you must know about Presbyterians and that there is not a policy or a position in place that is not biblically grounded. So when you hear someone say, I want biblical preaching, I don't want politics in church, those are, those are not, uh, they're not synonymous. They're not, you, you can't do that. Every now and then we need to hear a word from God that reminds us, like in the Exodus, that the slaves were God's children and needed to be freed, and someone like Moses needed to step up even though he didn't feel he could speak. That is our calling as children of God, to speak when God asks us to speak. So this week, go out and speak. Vote your conscience, for God alone is the Lord of the conscience, not even the church. Do what you can. And be thankful for one thing about GCPC. We support our civil responsibility to vote by making space available for people to come here and vote. And give thanks for those in our congregation. There's another opportunity. Raise your hand if you're going to be working at a poll. If you're a poll worker this week, I know you're there. See, I told you. Thank you. We may not like the results, but that doesn't mean we take up arms against each other. We did that once and it worked, but I don't advocate for that. What I do want to say is that we need to respond to those decisions that are made in our government with respect and honor those and continue to work to change those things that do not bring justice for all people. So go this week, my friends. Be faithful citizens of the kingdom of God, where God alone is Lord of the conscience, sovereign over all the nations and rulers. Amen.